Hello, my creative brothers and sisters, Sourdough here. And I want to tell you about some cool new things we got for you at NotRealArt.com. We just launched our artist education program where you can learn and grow your arts career. We call it the Not Real Art School. Not Real Art School features five free courses with top artists and business experts, all who spoke at our Creators Conference in 2019. Our free courses include important business topics for any artist, such as how to protect your art, how to market your art, how to license your art, and even how to pitch your ideas in Hollywood. Our Not Real Art School program also contains free career advice from top artists who tell you how they achieve success in their careers. These artists include Jorge Gutierrez, Logan Hicks, Julie B., and Human. Take advantage of this empowering content today. Just visit notrealart.com and click on the school link to get access to this valuable educational content. And the best part is, it's all free. Yes, free. So you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Visit notrealart.com today to learn this important business knowledge and grow your arts career. Here's more good news. Not Real Art now offers a new art buying program in collaboration with LA-based art publisher Sugar Press Art. This is great news because now you can easily buy cutting-edge contemporary art at affordable prices and get free shipping with every purchase simply by going to notrealart.com. Sugar Press publishes over 80 amazing contemporary artists that I know you'll love. Artists include Colette Miller, Aaron Yoshi, Jorge Gutierrez, Man One, Risk, Tanner Goldbeck, Max Neutra, Two Fly, and many, many more. To take advantage of our new art buying program, simply go to notrealart.com, click on shop, and you'll be there. You'll find all these amazing artists at affordable prices, and you'll get free shipping. Okay, heads up, my creative brothers and sisters. Not Real Art now has an exclusive membership program designed just for you. If you're an artist or an art lover and you appreciate what we do here at Not Real Art and you'd like to join the family and help support the cause and celebrate creative culture and the artists who make it, please consider becoming a member today. Your membership will help support our work, such as funding our artist grant and production costs for all the programs and content we produce. Your membership will also help us stay independent and commercial free. And when you do become a member, you'll get valuable benefits and perks we think you'll find very cool. And becoming a member is super affordable. Just $5 a month for artists and $10 a month for art lovers. So to become a member of the Not Real Art family, simply go to notrealart.com, click on membership to sign up, and help us celebrate and elevate the creative culture we love and the artists who make it. Thank you. Warning. The Not Real Art Podcast is intended for creative audiences only. The Not Real Art Podcast celebrates creativity and creative culture worldwide. It contains material that is fresh, fun and inspiring and is not suitable for boring old art snobs. Now, let's get started and enjoy the show. Greetings and salutations, my creative brothers and sisters. Welcome to Not Real Art, the podcast that covers creative culture and the artists who make it. I'm your host, Sourdough, and we are back, back, baby, from our summer hiatus, ready to share more great episodes with you about all things creative. But before we get into this, I want to shout out to my co-host, Man One, the one and only, who won't be with us for a while because he's on an on assignment working on a big project. So, of course, the podcast takes a back seat to his artwork. Like, what the hell? But you're stuck with me until our hero returns sometime in the not-too-distant future. But it's great to be back. And while I'm at half power without my co-host, Man One, I'm still sourdough power, and I'm going to do my best to uh, get us through this. Because I tell you what, it's been a crazy 
fucking year, right? 2020. What the hell? I mean, (laughs) I don't even know what to say that hasn't already been said. We definitely got sucker punched by the universe this year, and it's really testing our wits and testing our character, and we get to see what we're made of in these tough times. And whether it's COVID or the murder of George Floyd or the upcoming presidential election, I mean, the hits just keep coming. I just, you know, wish everybody well. Hope that you and your family have been healthy and safe during this time. If you are somebody who has been a victim of abusive police and harassment of the cops, we stand with you. We stand with Black Lives Matter and we have to stand for the truth. We have to stand for justice. And we have to stand for what is moral, what is ethical, and what is right. And I believe the truth will prevail in the end, but it is a process. And unfortunately, it's a messy process. It takes way too long. It doesn't happen as fast as we would like. But we have to keep fighting and we have to stay focused. And we also have to stay positive as hard as it is to do so sometimes. And I think we need to, on some level, also lead with love and compassion and empathy, which seems to be in short supply in our world these days. And so here we are, and we're on the precipice of the presidential election with only, what, 10 weeks or so to go from the big day, whether you vote by mail or go to a polling place, we have to vote this year. I mean, if you haven't registered already, time the clock is ticking, be sure to go register so that you can vote this year because the power structure is doing everything it can to suppress the vote and make it as difficult for us to vote and for our voices to be heard. So time isn't on our side. Every day, every second counts. So get out there to register and get out to vote. This is arguably the most consequential presidential election in our country's history, certainly in my lifetime. And it's a chain. We need change. You know, we need new blood. We need a revolution in some ways. In all candor, I don't think Joe Biden's going to give us that revolution, but I think he's the lesser of the evils. I'm not super excited about Joe Biden, believe me. He's definitely old guard, old school, legacy politician, but anything is better than Trump. And I'm going to I'm going to vote for Biden as a result, and I hope you do too. Listen, listeners out there who were sad not to get Bernie on the ticket or Elizabeth Warren, me too. It was disappointing, you know, certainly, but we can't not vote. We have to vote and throw our energy behind Biden. I hope if you were a Bernie supporter or a Warren supporter that you'll indeed vote for Biden and not waste your vote by not voting at all because this year is no joke. The shit is real and we got to make change and we got to make change by voting for Biden and getting Trump out. And the other thing is we can't just win by a point or two. We got to win by a significant margin, which makes your vote that much more important and powerful. Because if we only win by a couple of points, Trump and the GOP are definitely going to throw shade on the efficacy of the results. And even if we do win by a significant margin, they're going to throw shade on the results of the election. So We've got to do whatever we can to mitigate their ability to question the results. we got to win by a wide margin. Therefore, every vote counts. So whatever state you're in, be sure to register to vote. Every state is different in terms of how long it takes to register, what you need to do, the hoops you need to jump through. And so don't waste time. Don't fuck around. Get out there. Get registered. Go vote and vote for Biden vote for change. Do not waste a vote by not voting. 
it's the first step in a long journey. I mean, I don't mean to sound like I'm a huge Biden supporter. I'm definitely, you know, not excited or thrilled. He's definitely kind of old school dude. His VP pick, Kamala, I mean, she's awesome. She definitely represents uh, the future of, of America. So that's a historic choice. And I'm really glad that he chose her. But we just got to, you know, we got to do what we can to to get Trump out. So anyway, enough said. You know how I feel. And I appreciate you putting up with my political punditry here. It's not a political show. It's an art show. And, you know, I guess maybe on a more positive note, uh, I should share with you what we're going to be talking about today. But before I do... Uh, I want to make sure you know that over the summer, we've been doing some cool stuff. We launched our Not Real Art School, which you probably heard about at the top of the episode. We've got great online courses that are free. If you go to notrealart.com, click on school, you can view the videos from our conference in 2019. we got some great speakers and experts and, and artists talking about how to protect your art, how to market your art, how to license your art, how to pitch your ideas in Hollywood. Um, so it's a great, great bit of content, educational, informational, inspiring, empowering. So go check it out at Not Real Art School, notrealart.com. Just click on school, follow the prompts. Also, we have a new collab with our friends over at uh, Sugar Press Art, the art publishing house in LA. And uh, you can now buy art from their amazing roster of artists uh, at notrealart.com. Just click on shop. You'll be thrusted into this amazing collection of artists and their art. And if you make a purchase, you'll get free shipping. So that's super cool. The other thing that we did this summer, so we started the membership program for Not Real Art. You know, everything we do here, we self-finance. We're independent. We're not commercial. We don't sell advertising. We've been paying for everything ourselves and we'll continue to do everything we do you know, regardless if uh, people support us or not, but we thought we'd give people the opportunity to show their support and help us fund the things that we do, whether it's the podcast or the grant or the events. So we started a membership program and you can read about that if you go to novelart.com and click on membership and check it out. Super affordable and you get a ton of cool perks. We have the artist tier, which is five bucks a month. We've got the art lovers membership for 10 bucks a month. And we have a artist patron program for I think 15 or 20 bucks a month, but you get some great perks and artists out there definitely check it out because there's some cool stuff on there that's worth way more than five bucks a month. I can tell you that. So I don't know, just check that out. Yeah. So today, I mean, we're back. I mean, it's crazy. We took the summer off, which we were going to do anyway, just to sort of plan for the fall season, what have you. you know, little did we know that, of course, with COVID and George Floyd and all the stuff going on that probably wouldn't be in the mood to, and we weren't in the mood to do any podcasting anyway. But so we're back though. And, you know, in thinking about the fall programming in terms of what we wanted to do, we didn't want to be tone deaf. We wanted to be part of the conversation. We didn't want to be trite. We wanted to be relevant and use this platform to try to speak the truth and make some change. And you're, we're going to be talking politics. We're going to be talking social justice. We're going to be bringing up some really interesting uh, guests and topics around that issue this fall, not just up to the election, but beyond the election, because these issues are important. And I think artists have a lot to say about these issues. But today we're going to talk to an artist who won our 2020 grant. A lot of you know that we have an annual artist grant, the Not Real Art Grant. We started in, in 2019 and we awarded 12 artists the grant in 2019. And 2020, we changed it up a bit. We brought it down to six artists, still $12,000 grant. So each of those artists got 2000 bucks. But we just don't want to give them money and walk away. We want to support them, elevate them, celebrate them, honor them, and give them a platform to help promote their work, tell their stories. And so each of those winners are going to be a guest on the podcast. And so we have six winners. We'll have six episodes featuring them, celebrating them, honoring them. And so today's episode, we're going to celebrate one of our winners, Gershon Kramer, a photographer who grew up in Peru and went to NYU, studied film, 
and eventually got into photography. And I just love his work. I mean, there's such a kind of a sculptural nature to his photography, believe it or not. It's kind of, there's like a stark honesty of, but yet a playfulness. It's super interesting what he does with his subjects in his work, as well as incorporating graphic design in his work as well, layered on the photographs. And so anyway, he's just a super smart guy, very talented, and we were grateful to have him submit to the grant. And he was ultimately chosen with his five other recipients. And uh, so today, you're going to hear me talk to Gershon Kramer about his work and uh, his journey as an artist. Before we get into it, I just want to thank you all for all the support and all the love over the last year and a half we've been doing this. And, you know, we love what we do here at Not Real Art, and it's a passion of ours. And so it's great to be back. And we missed you guys. Hopefully you missed us. And so we're back in the saddle. More to come. And let's stay focused, people, because the shit is getting real. And without further ado, let's get into this. Let's hear from Gershon Kramer, 2020 Not Real Art Grant recipient. Gershon Kramer, welcome to Not Real Art. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here today. I'm so glad you're on our podcast. Do you listen to podcasts? Have you ever been on a podcast before? No, it's my first time on a podcast. I don't listen much to podcasts, I have to admit. Very, very, very occasionally, and I really don't follow any. I'm more of a visual person, so listening to conversations, unless I see video, it's a little hard for me. I, I guess I'm not old-fashioned enough in a way. <laughs> it turns back to radio, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Well, and I'm guessing you're not an audiobook fan. I'm not. I prefer a real book. Yeah, no, I've never, I never. I think I bought an audiobook twenty years ago or something like that. And like I said, um, not my. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm so grateful for you to be on the show. When it comes to your media consumption, do you watch a lot of movies, a lot of film? Yeah, well, I, I actually I do. I was trained in film and, and moving pictures. I didn't study really photography, so that's what I was immersed in for many, many years. And then, yeah, I mean, uh, lately I, I became a member of the Criterion Channel, uh, which is wonderful. Wonderful. I, I can't stop watching the insane amount of quality films yes. that happen. Well, and now that we're all living in quarantine, we have a lot of time for movies, don't yes, we? Of course. <laughs> you know, one of the one of the things that I was looking forward to asking you about actually is growing up in Lima. Mm -hmm. How did your family uh, end up in Peru? Oh, oh it's a long story. It's an immigration story. Mm -hmm. um, my father was born in Romania. Mm -hmm. His father left Romania after there was a fire in the business on his way to New York to make America, mm -hmm. which at the time was come to America, work a few years, go back to Europe with the money. Yes. But someone on the boat told him that in Peru, he could pick gold from the street. Right. And my grandfather was not a very smart man. It's a well-known family fact. So he paid attention to this person and went to Peru and ended up in this little town in the north, like this, it was like an oil town or some sort of thing and lost, uh, you know, it was like a hundred years of solitude kind of situation. And he built a store there and then he called for the family to come join him. So that's on my dad's side. On my mother's side, her father was born in Poland and he didn't want to fight World War I, so he left and ended up in Brazil. And then they, he went to Uruguay where he met my grandmother who was from Turkey. Mm -hmm. My mother was born. And then my parents met in Peru because my great-grandmother was making my mother's family insane, so they left. Mm. And again, they were on their way to L.A. Mm -hmm. but they stopped in Peru, and they liked it there, so they stayed. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then they met in Peru. That's how my parents met. And that was, what, in the 40s? Is What decade was that? Well, my mother 
married in the 50s. Okay. Yeah, I'm the youngest of three. Mm -hmm. And there's a big space between the siblings. There's a big amount of years. So growing up in Lima, I mean, what was that like? Well, looking back at it, it was a very valuable experience because I'm an American citizen. I love this country. I've been living here longer than I have in Peru. And I've always loved it here more than there. But it gave me a a different uh, perspective to come here when coming here and looking at this country. Yes. How can I put it? I mean, our appreciation for democracy, Peru was under a military dictatorship until 1980. So, I mean, it's really heartbreaking to see what's happening these days because I I know what that's like. I know how to be in a, a... you know, to have a dictatorial government is like. Yes. So, okay. you know, hopefully we get out of this very soon. So I, I ask for a number of reasons. One of those reasons being the fact that I actually have been to Lima and oh. I have spent a little time in Peru. Oh. Back when I, in my 20s, I had the chance to participate in the Quechua pilgrimage to uh, Coriti in the, in the Andes Mountains. We were thing in Cusco. Mm -hmm. uh, And we were trekking in the Andes for about a month. And it was just a a powerful trip. But we spent time, of course, in Machu Picchu, but also spent time in Lima on our way Mm -hmm. to and from uh, Cusco. So anyway, I had a wonderful time there. And so when I learned you were from Lima, Mm -hmm. I said, oh, well, that's, uh, that's a fun fact about you. How do you think growing up in Peru impacted your work as an artist? Well, hmm, it's an interesting question because a lot of people ask me, you're a Latin American, but your work doesn't reflect, there's no Latin American to it. And yes, it is something that I have tried to avoid. First of all, I mean, I, I love a lot of things about Peru. It's not a country where I would want to live at this moment. I mean, but they're really wonderful things. I don't want to say anything about it. But where was I going with this? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, because we're all we're all shaped by our environment. Right. Uh, well, well, how did it affect my work? I mean, on the contrary, I tried to make my work the most, in in a way, the most generic possible. Interesting. Not only in question of nationality, but also of gender. Hmm. There's a thing that they call the the male gaze, and I truly try to avoid it as much as I can, you know, or at least in my selection of images, so that I like the fact that a lot of people that has seen the picture without knowing anything about it, many thought that it was a woman photographer. Yes. So I try to stay very, very neutral in that sense, and because the, the image must be transcendental in a way. It must transcend itself. And I think if you have any sort of context to it, if you add any sort of a flavorful references, if you like, it loses its universality. Yes. Well, in your pursuit for that neutrality, I'm sure it's a it's a process, it's a journey. You you must work to maintain it and improve that neutrality. But how difficult was it to get to that point where you felt like, okay, I feel as though I've achieved this uh, transcendence or this indifference to the subject, what have you, as as a male photographer trying to take kind of gender out of it. When was that breakthrough for you? I think the breakthrough was in 2015. And the breakthrough was basically the fact that I became comfortable working with men. Mm, interesting. Before that, it was a bit difficult for me, but then working with the human body, it's very easy to sexualize. Yes. And which is something that I try to avoid, at least an objective sexualization of it. And by that, I mean that if the subject, the, the personality, the character of the subject has a sexual aspect to it and it becomes manifest through whatever it is in the image, that's okay. 
But, you know, when the sexualization comes from the outside, that there for me is the problem. So working with men has become, it was very good for that. It was very good to further desexualize the image as much as I could and neutralize that as, as much as I could. I like shooting with men more than women now mm, mm. because there's some really interesting work, though I direct them the same exact way. So when that breakthrough came in terms of working with men, what had been the barrier prior to that? Was it just sort of you were sort of more used to working with women? You had maybe more access to female models? Like, well, like right. why, why weren't you working with men? Right. Well, the thing was, I kind of jumped into this by accident. Okay. And there's a website, which is a, a point of contact for photographers, model, makeup artists, designers, etc. And models will state if they shoot nudes or not. And with men, it was very difficult to find a model that I liked, that I wanted to shoot, that I felt comfortable creating an image with, who would shoot nude. I found more dancers later on. Mm -hmm. because I shot this uh, female dancer and she mm -hmm. put me in contact with all the male dancers that she knew. Yeah, And it worked much, much better than with actual male models. Isn't that interesting? Because that totally makes sense, right? When you think of it, but you, until you met a dancer, you weren't necessarily conscious of working with dancers, right? Right. I had worked with dancers and I do enjoy working with dancers because mm -hmm. they have such control over their bodies. So for them to, to discard that during yes. the shoot, to discard that control is fantastic what the body by instinct, by inertia comes up with, yeah. especially well, that, with an educated body like that. Right, right. You're so well trained. I bet it's, well, I don't know, it'd be interesting. I mean, do you think it's easy or difficult for them to turn that training off and just be human and be natural? I always say about the people that I work with that experience is not necessary at all. All that a subject has to do to work with me is just to follow my direction, which is very, uh, just react to what I say. And it has been a process to craft this discourse that, which happens in each shoot because it is a discourse that the subject reacts to in order to finally capture and create that, you know, the final image. I'm always talking during the shoot. I'm so no, mu no music? Just no, there music. is music. The, the, yeah. the subject gets to choose whatever music they want to hear, but I'm constantly talking. I'm constantly talking. I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you give me an example of some of the words or the statements or the things that you're saying to direct your models, or is it just so <laughs> spontaneous and so random uh, for the moment uh, that you can't really replicate it. It's a flow of consciousness, but it, it is a prepared flow of consciousness. There is a script to it. There are recurrent themes that come back mm -hmm. at the moment that I believe they're necessary at. <laughs> right. To give you an example, it would sound ridiculous. It would be like giving away the Masonic right. secret in the sense that if you just receive it, it's a ridiculous thing yeah. without any context. Well, right. But I mean, in, in terms of context, right? Like when I think about your work, whether it's void or veils or safe images or fake memory, clearly there is, for lack of my words, not yours, there's a, a concept that you're aiming for. There's a, there's a theme or themes that you're trying to communicate within that body of work. So is that kind of the through line for you then in terms of what you may or may not be saying in a given shoot with a given model working within that framework? Well, I mean, everybody's different. So everybody reacts to things in different ways. Mm -hmm. The thing is, what do you detect? What do you detect in the reactions of the subject? and how you accommodate to the mm -hmm. subject. Mm -hmm. So my purpose when working is to, for the subject to become irrational, it to go through a sort of cathartic process in which the body moves automatically. Mm -hmm. That's create things when it's not in control. Mm -hmm. You come up with truly unique yeah. expressions. 
And I don't mean expressions of the face because the body becomes very expressive. The body becomes very eloquent. So it almost becomes like a text in this situation. And yes. the, the viewer just fills in the blanks. Yeah. I, one of the things that resonated with me about your work from the first time I saw it, and I believe when you applied for the Not Real Art grant, which you inevitably became a recipient of, which is why we're here today, part of what spoke to me about your work, and I believe it was Vale's, I believe you mm-hmm. submitted some pieces from sure. Vale's body of work, but it was so sculptural. There was something about mm-hmm. it that was the way the body was and the, the kind of the movement or the, the position that the model mm-hmm. was having. I mean, it, yes, it was the human body, but it somehow felt inhuman. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. No, no, of course. Yeah. Well, I try to avoid photography. Right, right. And what do I mean by that? First of all, I avoid looking at good photography. Like I said, I didn't study photography. I kind of jumped into it a little bit, you know, virginal mm-hmm, mm-hmm. about it. My idea from a certain point after the first six months that I started to shoot, Mm -hmm. the idea of leaving, of taking out a context, making the image, the uh, the photograph, the least photographical possible, making an unphotographic image in a way. So I really appreciate what you say because it means that I'm doing something right. Well, good. Uh, um, you know, the other <laughs> thing, I, the other thing I appreciated about your work, I do appreciate about the work, and I'm, maybe it's objects mm-hmm. where you've taken a photograph of a human form, but then you've overlaid these very sort of one-dimensional, even kinds of graphic objects where it's a, either a red square or a circle or something, and you're covering the body uh, and just that uh, you, mean, you mean veils that was the veils okay i'm sorry yes but, yes, yes. Yes. but just the the juxtaposition to me was quite well there's a playfulness in it too mm-hmm. uh that i like yeah. yeah well like i was saying you know the it's it's a further step in the process of removing text right from right. the image make it even more abstract mm-hmm. You remove the body, you, you cover it, you replace it with something else. But, you know, the body's still mm-hmm. there. And also, you know, you see the shadows that I leave behind. And yeah. that, I think, makes it very effective. But it's a further step. It's still a process. My work is constantly changing in the sense that, for me, I mean, I, I do very similar things, but it's kind of monotonous. Mm. to process it in the same way all the time. So I'm always looking for new ways to manipulate or turn the image into something else. Like in objects, there was a time that I was I could afford to make these sculptures with these photographs and these, these lenticular sculptures, you know, which were um, really expensive to execute. But in the end, they paid themselves, which was nice. But it's, again, the idea of turning the, 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 the medium into something else. Well, and photography gets a bad rap sometimes, right? As not being a legitimate art form. Or yeah, it's the lazy man's art. The lazy man's art. And I want to talk about it because I think in our interview with you, you talked about the fact that you know, it's a lazy man's art and then it was perfect for you because you're lazy or something. I said, this is one of the most prolific artists I know. Your body of work is phenomenal. And the fact that you would somehow reference it or reference yourself within the context of being lazy would just made me laugh. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it is. Now with, uh, when COVID started, I stopped shooting. Yes. I've only had some sessions, some portrait sessions with my wife, which are lovely. And she's also shot me. Mm-hmm. And that's about all I've been able to do. When we were talking the other day, sort of in the run up here to our time together, you were talking about how you're using this time to look back even on some of your older work mm-hmm. and maybe trying to see it anew right. and and differently and that you're taking a painting and you're doing so talk about how you're coping with covid in terms of your creative process okay well for me it's very difficult to not work to not uh, do something so um, yeah i mean i have an archive or of close to a million images (laughs) i have about uh, 
I said only a million? I have uh, like 40 terabytes of hard drives full <laughs> of images. Fantastic. That I've shot since 2012. So luckily, I have plenty of material to keep me entertained. <laughs> and yeah. more very interesting is to look back at the work of the earlier work, because you know at that time I was shooting with a little camera. I had no lights. I had no studio. I was just shooting every angle that I could of my apartment back then. Then eventually, as I saw that something was happening there, I detected that there was something that was worth developing is when I started to add lights at a a simple studio, $35 lights from Amazon, a better camera, this kind of thing. So the process came until technically I have a very good studio for my purposes, Mm -hmm. as well as a very good uh, camera equipment and lights. Um, No, but it was a process that took years. So to look back at those early images, which is so, so, so different Mm. from what I'm doing now, and try to interpret them in a different manner, mm. turn them upside down sometimes, in a way, mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. an interesting process. I have some successes here and there, but it's still, it's an ongoing process. What else can I tell you? Well, tell me about the painting. What are you painting? What, are you, what kind of paints are you using? Okay. What does your painting process look like? Okay, well, a painting has become, uh, I mean, I do it for fun. I'm not taking myself seriously at all. I am painting with oils. Mm-hmm. I started with a few paintings in, in acrylic, and then I disliked acrylic very much, and I tried some oils, mm. which I really, really love. My style is... If I was painting this 100 years ago, I would have been considered avant-garde. Very German expressionistic, 19, tw- early 20s kind of thing, what the Nazis called the generative art. So it, it makes sense that I would be painting something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, but you said your wife is shooting you now, too. You're shooting each other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we, she, she oh, shot portraits like, of me a few times. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing, yeah. Yeah. We, 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 I mean, I, I couldn't do this without her. She's a great support for me. How did you guys meet? Oh, for um, it's a very long story. Uh, we've got all the time in the world. It's no, I mean, this is like two hour long story. <laughs> <laughs> it's very complicated. It's very, very complicated. We leave it for some other time. Maybe if we get together for a drink okay. after okay. the pandemic, I'll tell you, and you'll meet her too. Well, we'll get a bottle of wine and uh, yeah. we can tell, you can tell me over the wine. How long have you been married? For, for years now. Four and a mm-hmm. half years. Mm-hmm. And she's an artist as well, right? An actor? An actor? She's an actor. Yep. She's an yep. actor, yes. She's um, very talented. I mean, uh, she started doing Chekhov in Chicago mm. in, in theater. And you know, she's very, very skilled at what she does. And the arts are a very difficult career to, to follow. You know, it's almost uh, yep. it's tragically heroic because uh, most of the heroes don't survive the battle. So... <laughs> It's, and it's difficult in the best of times. Yeah, and now uh, it's terrible. I mean, yeah, yeah now it's really, really terrible at times. But we're doing, we're taking it day by day, one day at a time, and making the most of every day, and we're hoping for the best. So tell me about Boris Fruman. <laughs> Boris Fruman. Boris Fruman was this teacher I had in college from the Soviet Union, who was such a hard ass, such a hard ass, so wonderful, wonderful, strict, non-nonsense teacher. If he didn't like what you were doing, he said, film is no good. You must work harder. I mean, he was very formative in my taste. And in the ways that I, I look at, at art and I look at films specifically and images. It's funny, um, a friend of mine mentioned him the other day. Uh, we were in the same class. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think you said, I read in your interview that you said that he, he taught you how to look at things. Yes. 
Tell me about the look. Explain that a little bit, because I mean, being an artist, right, is sort of rooted in this ability to see. Right. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, you look how to look at things, but from a perspective of a moving image. So you're looking at foreground, middle ground, background, especially in a moving image where the frame is changing, you're composing the whole time with every movement of camera. I don't think in terms of foreground, middle ground, and background when I'm shooting studio, because there's nothing. However, if by any chance, very rare chance, which happens every time a bishop dies, I shoot on a location. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I like it too, in a very different way, because I'm thinking in a completely different way when I'm shooting a location. I'm shooting in terms of what Boris was talking about. Mm-hmm. And not only foreground, middle, background, but discovery of new spaces within the frame and so on and so forth. And to make an image meaningful, that is the most important thing. In film, with the image, you're communicating something. You don't need, you don't need sound. You just need, you know, with a close-up of a face followed by something else, cut with something else, can mean so many different things. Mm. He taught me how to think in those terms. What are you trying to say with your work? What am I trying to say? And even more, like, what do you want people to know about your work? Well, I mean, I like to think of myself almost like a transgression of photography. Mm. And, and I don't mean that, I mean that in, in turning it upside down in a way or, or on its side or make it into something different. What am I trying to say with my work? It's such a hard question for anybody, I'm sure, to answer. Yes. But it is a game. It is playful, like you say. Yeah, and it is also a struggle because you... And that's the reason why I work with series. And I focus on one series in a certain period of time mm-hmm. because I, I don't want to repeat myself, mm-hmm. at least visually. Mm-hmm. So an image has to be very different from what was previously done or manipulated in a different way from what I did previously every time I start working on something new. I don't know how to answer that question. I'm sorry. What am I trying to say? With my photography it, 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 is, is just yeah. a strip the body, the image to its most austere, mm-hmm. basic form. Well, it, there's a purity and an integrity that I love about your work that seems to be a result of the, I don't know, call it a distillation process. Like you're just like distilling down or you've worked hard to get to a point where your work is distilled to its most honest place, if that makes sense, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's my, that's my feeling of it. Sure. Thank you. That's very kind. Yeah, I mean, and that is the idea of austerity, which is very important in my work. Uh, my, my first show in a gallery that I will not mention was called <laughs> Stylistic Austerity. I don't mean to jump around, but I want to ask you about something because it was interesting when you started to tell that story because you said your first gallery show, your gallery that you won't mention. Um, which sort of implies that maybe there was some sort of disappointment or conflict or something, which gets to part of the artist's struggle and part of the business of art and the dysfunction of the art world in many ways. So I won't ask you the name of the gallery. You won't tell me anyway. But talk about some of the professional business related struggles that you've had as an artist because so many artists have similar struggles some artists have very different struggles but there's learnings and wisdom in the sharing of these dramatic moments can you share a little bit bit about some of the hard lessons that you've learned in the business side of art well you have to be persistent (laughs) that's number one and you have to believe in your work I mean, you have to be absolutely certain of it and the quality of it on the, the presentation. Is it a professional presentation? Is this the best presentation you can do of it? It's a struggle to have people look at your work. Nobody wants to see your work. Nobody cares. That's the reality of it. 
when you finally get one person to come and see the work, I mean, it's such a victory, even if nothing happens. Out of the, I don't know how many studio visits I've had, but at the moment, I mean, I work with a few galleries in LA and outside of LA, but right now I'm only working with one gallery in LA. It is very difficult because nobody really cares. Now, this gallery is wonderful. I'm very happy with them. They treat uh, artists like human beings. And uh, the owner is a lovely person. Lovely, lovely person. I mean, he's a businessman. Mm -hmm. And he has been in the market for 25 years. So it's not a gallery that has been that lasted two, three years or anything. He's established. But yeah, no, I mean, a lot of very unpleasant experiences, of course. And a lot of wasted time. I can't say that it's wasted time. Not if you're learning. Not if you learn from it, or at least use it as practice. Yes. So is your work is sold right now exclusively through this gallery? Do you sell uh, directly through your studio? Like how does... Yes, how- to studio, gallery, mm-hmm. website, Instagram, whatever. Although Instagram, my Instagram now has become pretty much political, but... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not showing that much work or that much outtakes. I mean, it's a place for my outtakes more than anything, mm-hmm. just because I have so many. Well, what about your business management? Do you handle and manage all of your business or do you, because so many artists struggle, right? With the business side of it. And for good reason, if business is hard and you want to make your art, you don't want to have to fill out an invoice or right. bill or chase a, you know, so, so how do you handle the business side of your practice? Well, I mean, the best I can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The most honest thing uh, yes, I can you'd say, yes, yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. I talk to artists all the time who really lament business, and I said everybody laments business. Nobody likes paying their taxes or, or chasing a, a client or what have you. This is this, unfortunately, is the nature of the beast. But there's learnings. I feel like that's one of the reasons why we like doing this podcast because we know that other artists listen and they can learn from each other. It's this knowledge sharing. Because one of the problems that I see with the art world as it's currently constructed is that it's very fragmented. And not just on the what I call sort of the, the demand side or the sales side, but on the supply side. So the artist, it's a very lonely existence. You know, there's very little community. Mm. And so a lot of isolation And to the extent that podcasts like ours can help to provide a little bit of community or a little bit of knowledge sharing, Mm -hmm. it helps other artists realize, oh, wait, it's not just me. I'm not alone. Gershon's having a similar challenge, and this is how he handled it, and this is how he learned. Gershon, there is a cat on your right shoulder. Yes. yes me. <laughs> who who do we have there? Who's just waltzed into the studio? It's Michi. Come here, baby. Oh, it's what Michi. a beautiful cat. Oh yeah, she's lovely. Come here. She doesn't like to be picked up. So she's gonna resist this as much as she can. Oh, she's gorgeous. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, she doesn't want to be. She doesn't want you right. She's very sweet otherwise, <laughs> but she, very, it's hard to pick her up. She, she was a feral cat. So. She, she doesn't want to do a cameo on the podcast. No. For our listeners, they should know that you and I are only recording audio. I We can see each other on the computer screen. And so I'm actually looking into your studio and your beautiful cat just walked out behind you. That was such a beautiful thing to see. Mm-hmm. What a beautiful space it seems you have. Where exactly is your studio and what am I seeing behind you there? Okay, well, I'm located in an industrial part of the city, close to downtown. I do have, I lucked out on this space. I've been here for six years and I, I love it. I mean, it's been an adventure. I have the train tracks under my window and the train passes under my window. Yeah. But the space is wonderful to be in. I have 1,500 square foot studio and, you know, which acts as many things. And what else would you like to know about it? Uh, what I have behind here, I have, I have, you know, this is the space where I shoot actually. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So the blank uh, background comes down mm-hmm. and covers that wall and I shoot looking in this direction. And what you see behind me are some framed images. Yes. yes. We have. 
Yeah, I see. I recognize them from here. So those look like they're sort of packaged up, kind of ready to ship. Have they sold or are they just coming back from a show? No, no, I just take care of them. Yeah, yeah. I just make sure that they're in pristine condition. So they're always wrapped and, I mean, visible, but wrapped. Mm Mm-hmm. So seeing, seeing those images behind you causes me to, to wonder how you recruit your models. Are they sort of friends of friends or do you have a more formalized process? Is it word of mouth or is it more formal? Well, at first it was completely formal because nobody knew me. Yep. Eventually, a word gets around. Now my best friend is Instagram. Yeah, yeah, right. And I see somebody on Instagram that I think looks interesting, I think would work for this and I contact them and they say, oh, yes, or oh, no. And uh, that's it. Yeah. That's how it is. Yeah, pretty much. And then people contact me as well. Mm -hmm. And And when they contact you, is that for a sort of a private commission for themselves then? or No, they just want to shoot with me. Yeah, got it. They want to shoot with me. I have a very good reputation. Mm -hmm. I have a good reputation for being a very safe place to shoot. Mm-hmm. A very safe person to shoot with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A very respectful person. Right. I consider the subject, the model, however you want to call them, uh, an artist as well. Yes. Uh, on equal standing. Yes. Because it is a collaboration. It's a collaboration in the end. Right. So I do inspire the model to, how do you say, behave in certain ways mm-hmm. in front of the camera whatever that may be. But again, everybody's different, and that's what makes it fascinating, and that's what makes every shoot interesting. It's just the difference between people Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they manifest irrationality in very different ways. Would you say that shooting is your quote-unquote happy place? When you're shooting, do you find yourself to be in a sort of a transcendent, joyful place, or is it perhaps more stressful and more intense than that? No, no, no. It's not stressful. Yeah. It's not stressful at all. Yeah. I only stress when I want to shoot my wife because uh, or a portrait or something because she has to be my best work. That's beautiful. So it's very intimidating. Happy wife, happy life. Don't fuck that up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, no way. No way in hell. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's wonderful. Well, you know, I just ask, right, because we're all on this journey as creatives, right? And I know I'm the happiest as a person when I'm being creative, working with creative people, creating, which really gets to kind of a mental health thing, right? Like it's sometimes very hard to find joy, even in the best of times. Now we're in this crazy year of 2020 with so many things going on to worry about and have anxiety around. But speak to your process around finding balance, caring for yourself, loving yourself, wellness. To so many artists, we were going to have our conference. You know, last 2019, we mm-hmm. started a conference for creatives and artists, the Not Real Art Creators Conference. And we had to cancel this year because of COVID. It was supposed to be in March. And one of the panels that we were going to have at the conference this year was about wellness and mental health. Because I know so many of my artist friends, sure. myself included, struggle with that a lot. And so how do you find peace of mind and take care of yourself? Well, I mean, I'm going to be completely candid here. Mm. For many, many years, I suffered from depression and anxiety. Mm-hmm. I used to be very heavily medicated for it. Mm. And it was uh, terrible. I mean, I still take the medication. But mm-hmm. I take the minimal amounts, the minimum amounts that you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used to take the maximum amounts before, mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. I became toxic. Well, you've gone a long way. It has been tra- transformative. I mean, I since I started doing yoga mm-hmm. every, almost every day, we do yoga minimum five days a week. Mm-hmm. It's uh, been very, very helpful. Mm-hmm. Also, I mean, I have to be candid as well. I mean, a small amount of psychedelics also help. Mm-hmm. Sure. Try to take it one day at a time. Yeah. It's very important because, I mean, you don't know what tomorrow, what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. new horror story is around the corner. So, yeah, every, uh, every day. I mean, laugh today because it might be the last laugh. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's interesting that you say that because I've said this a lot myself, which is the only thing, because everything's so out of control. And part of the reason why people feel so depressed and so sad is because they feel like they have no control. And mm-hmm. oftentimes they don't. Yeah. And the only thing we can't control, right, really is our attitude and how we approach each day. And you have to break it down into the day. Today is a day, let's take one day at a time, let's challenge ourselves to laugh and to find joy in the small moments. Right, and then to be creative. I mean, don't stop being creative. I mean, find a way. That's the greatest joy. Yes. You find, and especially if you're satisfied with the product, Mm. which is hard to be. I mean, i give you an example of how I work. I shoot close to 2,000 images per shoot. Mm Mm-hmm. And if I choose one image of those 2,000 to be on my website, I'm very lucky. (laughs) Because it usually takes about 10 to 15 shoots to find one image. Well, that's that's thanks to Boris. (laughs) (laughs) Boris beat it into you, yes. Yes. But enrich your life as much as you can. Go out for walks in state parks. Mm-hmm. Where, you, where you hike if you can be be at nature as much as you can it's very helpful I, I've always been a city person I've mm-hmm. always kind of had a disdain for nature for many many years yeah you've seen the movie Antichrist by Lars von Trier it's a fantastic quote nature is Satan's church I used <laughs> to go by that <laughs> I, I laugh, well, only because it, you're, you, it's quite funny, but clearly you've, you've evolved, right? Now you're saying that you love nature versus... Yes. Uh, versus and, but uh, nature is my church. That's where I find sure. uh, God. And so it's interesting to, to see that because the truth is nature is a motherfucker. It will kill you. Oh, yeah. And- it wants to kill you. <laughs> it wants, it to, wants kill to kill you. you. So, you know, it's beautiful, but sure. it'll kill you. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes. You know, it's the cycle of life. It wants to kill everything it it can, and so that others may live. Mm, yeah, <laughs> part of it, part of it. Well, so you mentioned yoga, which gets to kind of a bit of a spiritual practice. Were you raised in a religious family, and what is your spiritual practice now in addition yeah. to yoga? Well, I mean, my mother, I mean, was in college in the 70s. Mm-hmm when uh, university was very politicized Mm. in Peru. Mm. We're under a military dictatorship, so it was very Mm left-wing. My mother is a historian Mm. with a Marxist bent, very materialistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we never grew up with religion in the house, really. I did go to a Jewish school in Peru, but it wasn't a religious school. It wasn't a yeshiva or anything like that. It was more of a Zionist school in the sense that they wanted you to move to Israel after you graduate. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it was a very good school. I mean, academically, it was very good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hated the school, but I'm grateful for a couple of teachers that I met there as well. One of them uh, teaches at Tufts today. No. Yeah. But why did you hate the school? Because... It was a, it was, how do you call it? It was an assembly line for doctors, lawyers, and businessmen. And housewives or child psychologists in the city you know, for women. Not, not um, artists. I didn't hear you say artists. No, it really tried to extinguish anything, anything of the sort. Interesting. Like I said, academically it was very good, but I was always the odd person there. I was never fully comfortable there. I was looked as like the crazy guy. At the time that I tried to do something for the school, I got in touch with the Cinematheque of Lima, of University in Lima, so they would lend us their films to project mm-hmm. at the school once a month and mm-hmm. to have a lecture on these films, you know, from the cabinet of Dr. Caligari in 1920 until, I don't know, some Antonioni films in the 60s. And I made this whole program. The principal looked at it and he said, you know, very good, but we can't allow you to do this because you, you, we don't want you to represent this school in any way. Wow. What a heartbreaker. Oh, yeah, I was pissed. <laughs> Just a soul-crushing thing to say. Isn't it? And he's well known as an educator. <laughs> yeah. 
it somehow it got you here and you're happy yeah. now, right? And yes, of course. And your path, you know, but it's interesting. I had a conversation. I don't know if you know the woman who the artist uh, here in LA, performance artist, he's uh, Miss Art World. I don't know. Do you know Miss Art World? I don't believe so. Okay. So Miss Art World, who's fantastic human being, she got her MFA from Pratt, but she has this interesting background. She's a beautiful uh, human, beautiful woman. And she sort of came up loving art and being a creative and she's very talented, but her art teacher, she has a degenerative eye disease. Oh. Her art teacher told her that she could never be an artist because she has an eye disease. Hmm. What a fucking thing to say, right? Like, who are these teachers, right? Anyway, I think yeah. they push us, right? No, they're and, good teachers and bad teachers. It's yes, as that's simple right. as that. That's yeah, that's that's right. That's right. Good ones and bad ones. So excellent uh, ones too. I am so grateful, Gershon, that you are part of the Not Real Art family now. When, when you, how did you hear about the grant? Do you remember? I'm going to be perfectly honest. When yeah. you called and left your message, I completely forgot that I had applied for this. <laughs> yeah. I never win anything. <laughs> yes. Join the- so when I heard your message, I was like, Oh, I, I couldn't, it was quite a surprise. I have to, very pleasant, and I'm very grateful for this. It was really kind and, and, and very humbled that, that was selected. Well, we were so grateful to get your submission and honored to have you as part of our community. We are now sort of entering this time where we want to really celebrate our grant recipients. And when, as you may recall, we talked about, you said, well, yes, you'll receive the money for the grant, but we also want to have you on the podcast Mm -hmm. to help tell the story. But we also want to further promote and celebrate each of the recipients' work. Last year, we curated an art exhibition Mm -hmm. with Art Share LA, our partner, and it was a wonderful event, wonderful turnout. And for some of the artists, it was their first show ever, which was really charming and wonderful to see because, you know, they were just so happy and proud as they should have been. But this year, of course, we are having to change things up a bit because of what's going on with everything. And so I want you to know we are sort of in the process of of working on a couple things. We're hoping to, uh, and I, I'm just sharing, nothing's etched in stone yet. What we're going to do is, well, A, we're going to have an online virtual exhibition space where people can come and see your work, see the work of the other recipients, but it'll be a virtual exhibition online. And we're going to put that together and we're going to promote the heck out of it on social media and through our networks and drive traffic to the show to see your work. The other thing that we've been working on and we're hoping to do is a more of a public installation that will be objected. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at different places around LA that we can do a public projection mm. of, of images featuring all the six grant recipients. So please stay tuned because <laughs> there will be more to come. And I'll be talking uh, more about this, reaching out to you because we really want to do anything we can to, to help you and help promote your work. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, if I may give you an idea. Please. It's not an original idea. I have a friend, Aldo Chaparro, who's a very, he's a huge artist in Mexico, mm. huge artist. His studio, but he has a studio in LA, in Mexico City, in Lima, and in Madrid. In each, mm-hmm. in each studio, there's a window that goes to the street. And mm-hmm. he's been showcasing different artists as a public exhibition for, oh. on the window. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rated and all of these things. And mm-hmm. if you can get a window, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a public area, that you can show a piece and just have it there for a month or two weeks or whatever and change yeah. it up, it could be a nice thing too. You yeah, know, I love the actual idea. physical object. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And yes, sure. uh, I will definitely put that in the list of, of ideas. Everything's so challenged in so many ways um, mm-hmm. in terms of trying to get anything produced. 
but we're just excited to be and grateful to know you and know your work. And as we wrap up today, please share with our listeners socials so that people can find you on Instagram or find your website so they can follow your practice. Thank you. Well, my website is www.gershonkramer.com. That's spelled G-E-R-S-H-O-N-K-R-E-I-M-E-R.com. My Instagram, which is political these days more than anything. Uh, As it should be. Right. I just found myself unable to keep quiet. And I think that this is a time that to be silent is an almost immoral thing to do. Yes. So, um, I mean, the best that I can, I have some followers. So at least, which I've been losing a lot since it became political. I've lost quite a bit, but I'm fine with that. I'm, I'm not interested in these people. If you're offended by my posts, I'm really not interested in you following my work. That's how I feel about it, because it's not about politics anymore. I think it's about humanity and what is right. Yes. Yes. No, I agree. As I've been planning the programming for the podcast, because the, as you know, the podcast is really meant to celebrate creative culture and talk about, you know, talk with great artists about great art and, and what have you. But certainly after the murder of George Floyd, I didn't feel right about trying to just keep talking about art in a way that that felt disconnected from really what was happening. So we are going to, at least between now and I guess January, certainly through the November election, we're going to dedicate a bunch of our podcasts and programming to political art and, mm -hmm. and political artists and talking about these issues because to be silent is to be complicit. Yes, of course. Absolutely. I never imagined in my life we would be in a situation like this. I mean, I never expected it that it could happen in this country. Yes. Never imagined it. I'm saying this as an outsider, you know, who has come from a, as an immigrant. It's really, I mean, it's really heartbreaking. Well, and as an immigrant who also has lived through a military dictatorship and understands what authoritarianism looks like and what have you, you can see, I mean, most Americans haven't left the country, right? Mm -hmm. So it's easy for them to think like, oh, this country has its prides messed up. And no, I mean, <laughs> if you go around the world, you can see how many blessings we have. I'm not an American that is naive about the genocide and the slavery that we did to make this country, but it's an experiment that has been getting better and better and better. And but now we are really taking a turn for the worse. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. And we have to struggle against this. It's a fight. We have to vote in November, no matter what. And yes. Vote them out. Because these people, they don't care about America. They only care about staying in power, enriching themselves, their cronies, and their donors. And yep. what is that? Yep. They have to be, get out. So everybody, please vote. Is the most important election in the history of in your life. The that, most well, that, that, election in this life. That's right. And I mean, to be frank, I'm not excited about Joe Biden, but mm. he is, he's the he's the lesser of the evils. No, I mean he's coherent to begin with. Yeah, <laughs> he's, coherent. he's not a bad person. I mean, he's not a cruel person. Right. I mean, he's not perfect by any means. But he has my vote, and I will try to get as many people to vote for him as possible. That's it. And we're going to be doing the same. I'm voting for him. My concern is I don't want Democrats or my liberal friends to get lazy because they hmm. think like, oh, there's no way Trump can win. He's botching this. And that's how we lost last time. Thought yes. that Hillary was a shoe in yeah. And, you know, it's all about the Electoral College. And if we don't win the Electoral College, lose. The thing is now we've gone through the Trump experience. Yeah, right. So we know what we're getting and the possibilities of what we can get in the second term. Yeah. We're aware of that. Before, we, a lot of people knew what Trump was, but uh, apparently not enough. Yeah, right. Now it's evident. I mean, if you support Trump, 
and you're in line with what he's saying and you believe that, I mean, I don't know what to say about a person like that. I'm sorry. I mean, their the values, their morality are completely in the gutter. No matter how religious or whatever patriotic they may think they are. But I don't know what else to say about this. It's just, it's just nauseating. Yes, it is nauseating. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's cut on that nausea. <laughs> Gershon Kramer, I am so grateful for you, for your work, for you being uh, part of our community. I look forward to an opportunity to break bread with you and drink Me wine. Too. Of, of how you and your wife met and <laughs> I hope that we from this point forward consider each other as friends Absolutely, and, uh, we'll do this again someday right uh, you know, hopefully the time will come that you can come over see the studio love that we hang out and uh, do whatever you want I look forward to that until then my friend thank you for sitting down for this fantastic conversation I'm so grateful for your time be well, be happy. Thank you. You too. I enjoyed this very much. Happy to come back anytime. And again, thank you guys so much for this grant. And, and I'm very grateful, doubly grateful for it. Oh, you're very welcome. And you for too. the attention. And the honor <laughs> all, all ours. Gershon Kramer, thank you so much, my friend. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode, write a review and share with your friends on social. And if you haven't already done so, please press the subscribe button and follow us on Instagram at Not Real Art World. If you're an artist, be sure to apply for our 2021 artist grant at notrealart.com. Sourdough, out.